I invite you to remain standing for the gospel lesson today, which comes from the gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. If you don't have your Bible with you, you'll find that in the Bible in the pew back in front of you. You'll find it on page 91 to help you with that in the New Testament. John chapter 6. Listen now to the word of the Lord and using one of the disciple Bible studies study tools, listen to things that you might hear and let your imagination think of the crowds and the things that would be happening in this text. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew himself that he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages could not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was, a day, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted, and they were all satisfied. He told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and as you are, Let us pray together. May your spirit, O God, stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together would be shaped, formed, and molded into the good news of the gospel of Christ in whose name we have gathered, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we will depart this place and seek to serve faithfully. And all of God's people did say, Amen. The location of this parable is a place that you can visit even to, the, to today. It's called Tabtha, and it is a place that's commemorated with a small chapel in, in the chapel of the floor, mosaics of fish and bread. When people look at this parable of this teaching, this, this event in Jesus' life in the Gospels, it's one that's contained in all four Gospels. There is quite a bit of debate amongst theologians Sometimes that debate becomes polarizing. On the one side of the polar argument is the idea that Jesus created fish in abundance and loaves of barley loaf from nothing but the five. It was a pure miracle of multiplication. In some ways it reflected the Latin of the ex nihilo, God creating the earth out of nothing. So that what Jesus created is what did not previously exist. Others move to another spectrum and they say, no, that this parable really is not about Jesus doing that. It's about Jesus unlocking the hearts of the people because all those mothers who came along had a sack like a purse and, you know, they had those little crackers and peanuts or goldfish in there and it was just a matter of setting free the hearts of the people. And I say to you, why does it have to be either or? And when I look at this parable, what's the greater miracle for God, the ones who casted the heavens and the earth to create something from nothing, or God, the one who created us, freeing our hearts and hands from what we have to share with others? I dare say sometimes the bigger miracle of God is changing us, not the world. But maybe it's both. But when we look at it, it's the only, only John has Philip and Andrew. And it's amazing that what we notice in this is a little boy who's brought forth from Andrew, Andrew the bringer. 
Philip has tested. Jesus asked him. He's from Bethsaida. Hey, where are we going to buy enough for everybody to eat? We can't do that. But it's Andrew who says, well, there's a boy here with some barley loaves and fish. Barley loaf was literally the loaf or the bread of the poor, it was known as. For you and I today, the parallel would be this. If you're going to the potluck and this barbecue and you're making your own sandwiches and you've got those loaves of bread, it would be as if you went and they said, only the heels are left. Now, I don't know about you, I love the heels of bread. I love the corners of brownies and all that. But it's sort of a way that we understand it was the, it was the bread of the poor. So it doesn't really matter what God has or who brings resources to God because the young boy within this parable would not be someone we would look to to solve the problem. The young boy, especially with what he has, just a couple of fish and some barley loaves, those resources would seem to be meager in comparison to the large need that exists. And yet what matters the most for us to hear is that it's not our ability to God, it's our availability it's our availability, bringing to God who we are with what we have and giving to God the resources that we have and letting God do the God thing and multiplying and collaborative work, pulling together the resources. Jesus makes everybody sit down. And there's sort of overtones we hear of another kind of grass that we're invited to lay down beside the smooth waters and still grass where God restores our souls. You see, there's something about when we see the needs of the world and we get busy, maybe the first thing we need to do is to pause and to ask, what is it that we could offer to God? Maybe we ought to ask, who is it we could bring along in the journey? Who is it that maybe the person who is the, the overlooked by everybody else that maybe they hold the key ingredient to meeting the need that exists? This is why we exist as a church to remind each other that it's not our ability that matters to God, but our availability, because it's not a matter of how big the problem is or how big the challenge is, because our God is always bigger than the problem. I once heard it said, don't tell God how big your problems are, tell your problems how big your God is. And I like the way that sounds. It's such a true thing. And so this whole passage has Eucharistic overtones. If you grew up in a Roman Catholic tradition, you know that Eucharist is the word that specifically is mentioned for the meal of Holy Communion. It comes from an understanding of being thanksgiving. And so when we say Eucharistic overtones, we say overtones are sort of a theme of Holy Communion that Jesus takes the bread and blesses it and distributes it. Like he does today. There is bread here. Bread for all. Bread enough for all. When we were in Paris, Texas at Calvary United Methodist Church, I will never forget the day as people came forward and that tradition in the church was to receive communion by intinction. A portion of the bread was broken off and handed to the person. And the person would take that bread as you do in the balcony and you dip it into the chalice and then you receive communion. The very end as here sometimes at the very end, there's no need to loop all the way around when you're on the front rows. You can go back to your row. At the very end, the last couple came up, the last few folks, and one of them was a younger boy, and you know how I like to kid with all of the children. And they came up, they took communion, they kneeled for a moment at the kneeler, we reset the table, we turned around, and the family was walking up the center aisle, and the little boy paused, and he turned around, and he said, hey, Pastor Bert, good bread. It's good bread today. It's good bread today because no matter how big the challenge is, our God is bigger. It's good bread because no matter how broken or inadequate you feel, our God is bigger. It's good bread because it's God's bread. It's the table that God has prepared. It's the table that God welcomes us all to. It's a table of grace. And so to give us a little different nuance today, we are going to not use the confession. We're going to immediately move into the great thanksgiving in a moment. And I want you to hear the liturgies that talks about a God's faithfulness because God's grace is never dependent upon you. But you're receiving that grace is dependent upon, your, dependent upon your availability to God. And in the same way you can open your heart and receive all that God offers you, you can close your heart and be calloused and keep walking on by. But know this, it's a table of grace today. It's good bread. It's bread. It's a table that God offers to us. 
It's reflective of the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 when he's reminding everyone that salvation is a gift from God. And all this is God's doing, not because of what we've done, but because God has lavishly poured out His grace upon us. And so we come today facing some challenges. I face challenges. I don't know what the future holds. As my dad used to say, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. There's changes that are on the horizon for you personally. There are changes on the horizon for this church and community of faith. There's changes on the horizon for the Palmers in transition. And so I come to this table just like you today from the waters of my baptism needing to be reminded that God is with me. That all I have to do is make myself available to God. Because what matters to God is not your ability, it's your availability. My friends, we gather this day around a table, a table that has nothing but good bread. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.